As you're well aware, we're living in unprecedented times. Join us now for today's special program. I want to spend my life mending broken people. I want to spend my life removing pain. Lord, let my words heal a heart that hurts. I want to spend. Welcome to 3ABN Today Bible Q&A. I'm Jason Bradley and I'm so glad that you've decided to study the Word of God with us and get some questions answered that perhaps you submitted, but definitely people like you submitted. Uh, and you're, if you didn't submit your questions, well, let me tell you how you can do that. You can send them to 618, text them to 618-228-3975, or you may email your questions to BibleQA at 3ABN.TV. Or if you have Instagram, you can go on Instagram at 3ABN underscore official and send your questions that way as well. I want to share this verse with you. It's found in Psalm chapter 119, verse 105, and it says, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. With that, there's no reason to be walking in darkness. Let me introduce you to our wonderful students of the word. We have here Shelly Quinn. It's a joy to be here. Oh, it's great to have you here, and I'm looking forward to hearing the answers that you provide from the Word of God. Got some difficult questions this time. Mm. Yes. We've got Pastor Ryan Day. It's great to have you here. And I'm blessed to be here. Love the Word of God, and I love giving truthful answers from His Word. Amen. Amen. And Pastor James Rafferty, Mr. 112 Episodes of Salvation and Symbols and Signs, it's great to have you here as well. <laughs> I thought he was going to say Mr. 112. <laughs> That'd be cool. Good to be here, Jason. Good to be here with the team. Good, good. All right. Well, before we dive into the Word of God, I'd like to ask that uh, we have a word of prayer. Mm -hmm. And Shelly, would you pray for us? Absolutely. Our loving Heavenly Father, we come before you right now. And Lord, how grateful we are for our Savior Jesus Christ, for your Holy Spirit and your Word. And we ask now, Lord, that you would lead us, guide us, send your Holy Spirit to be our teacher and help us to point out correct answers, mm -hmm. truthful answers from your Word. We pray for your blessing over all of our viewers. Thank you so much, Lord. We get the privilege of doing this for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Shelly, I'm going to go to you first with okay. the first question. Uh, my question is about 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 4. How can Bathsheba be purified from her uncleanness if she slept with David? This uh, is from Tanya out of Greensboro, North Carolina. Okay, Tanya, let's, let me tell a little of the backstory here. 2 Samuel 11, before this, God had selected David as king because he said David was a man after his own heart. And boy, David had honors after honors and successes after successes right up till this time in 2 Samuel chapter 11. What happened? He sent his men off to the battlefield. He decided he was going to stay at ease in Jerusalem. And so one night he's out or at late afternoon, he's walking on his roof and he glances over and he sees a beautiful woman bathing. And instead of turning his lustful eyes away, he feasts on Bathsheba's naked body. And he knew she was the wife of one of his noble soldiers. Mm. But he stooped to a low that he had of degradation and shame he never had before. And here's what happened, 2 Samuel 11:4. 4. 
Then David sent messengers and took her. The messengers took Bathsheba and she came to him and he lay with her for she was cleansed from her impurity and she returned to her house. She was cleansed before he laid with her. What is it talking about? In Leviticus chapter 15, verses 19 through 30, it talks about the ceremonial ritual cleansing that a woman went through after her menstrual cycle. I think the reason this is added in the story here, she had been through, Bathsheba had been through this ritual, but this proves to us it wasn't Uriah's baby. We know that when she laid with David, it was his child. Mm. And, uh, you know, the rest of the story is this. So your answer to your question, she was purified before, but the rest of the story is David repented, God forgave him, but the consequences were horrible. God said that the sword shall never depart from your house. And David's house had a lot of misery, mm. scandals. It was awful. Mm, mm, amen. Thank God for his forgiveness, though. Amen. Thank God amen. for his forgiveness. That's Pastor right. Day, we're going to come to you next. All right, all right. Um, if we all come from Adam and Eve, how do we get all the races in the world? <laughs> you know, that's a really good question. Uh, and I'll just be honest with you. The Bible does not explicitly tell us how we get all of these different skin tones and the different races and whatnot. But there are a few texts uh, that we can pull together to try to make sense of this. Um, obviously, people try to use this question to try to, you know, question the validity of Scripture, you know, of all of us came from Adam and Eve, or in this case, we know we all came from the family of Noah, right? So where do all these different skin tones mm -hmm. come from? Well, the Bible must, must not be true, right? Not necessarily. When we get to Genesis chapter 11, which was not too long after the flood and after Noah's time, uh, you get there to the Tower of Babel, and we see there that they built this tower to reach into the heavens. Basically, it was Nimrod's project shaking the fist at God because mm -hmm. he did not like God for what he had done, you know, with the flood and destroying, you know, all of the people. And so it was a way to, you know, worship their false pagan gods and also try to get one over on God. But yet we know that the Bible says in Genesis 11, and I'm going to start reading in verse 7 here. It says, come, this is God speaking, the Godhead. And it says here, come, let us go down there and confuse their language that they must not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth and they ceased building the city. And therefore, after these different tribe, after these different people scattered, scattered all over to the different regions of the earth, they would have broken up into different tribes, different clans, uh, you know, different and scattered into different nations and broken up amongst themselves. And of course, uh, you know, this brought about the intermarrying and intermingling, which brought about different genetic uh, forms and uh, different gene genetic traits uh, that became more predominant than others in certain regions and certain ethnic groups that we find today spring from that. Now, is there an explicit text that tells us all of this? We have to kind of look back at the history. We have to study it in accordance with what the scripture says. How, how these different skin tones came about, you know, there's again, not an explicit text that tells us, but you know, I believe the Bible makes it clear that God, and if you read, you read this in Psalm 139 verse 13, God knits us in our womb, mm -hmm. in our mother's womb. And we see traits and things that babies are born with today. And it's like, how in the world? He didn't get that from his mom. He didn't get that from his dad. She mm -hmm. didn't get that from, you know, their parents. But nonetheless, God knits us together in a womb. And, and, and I know there's going to be one day we're going to get to heaven and God is going to give us the answer to this question. Mm. But I believe it springs from the nations being scattered to these different regions and therefore we get the different predominant uh, traits, genetic traits, so forth and so on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What a day that's going to be when we get to heaven right. to ask right. all of these questions. <laughs> we'll take our that's Bible right. Q&A up there. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. I love it. Best I like that. Pretty. I like that. Um, <laughs> kindly indicate the biblical counsel given to assist Seventh-day Adventist Christians in selecting a spouse. Also, please advise if a Christian has to consider horoscope or zodiac sign compatibility mm. of his or her potential spouse, and if this is a part, if this is part of the biblical guidance given by God. This is from Brother Hale. All right, Brother Hale. Well, if we go to the Bible, we're going to find in Genesis chapter 2 that God says that it is not good for a man to be alone. I will make a help meet for him. And of course, later on in that section, we realized that God put Adam to sleep, took a rib out of his side, took that rib right out of his side, and then of course gave him his help meet. So if you're a believer in the all-powerful, all-knowing God, 
You don't need to go to a horoscope. You don't need to go to a zodiac sign. Mm -hmm. you, you know, we, God doesn't want us to be alone. So God is going to provide for us. It's not a horoscope that provides for us. It's not luck that provides for us. Mm -hmm. It's not chance that provides right. for us. It's God that provides for us, right. according to Genesis. And then what we, what we need to realize is the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 19 and verse 14, a prudent wife is from the Lord. So the first step, you wanted an outline, Brother Hale, the first step in finding a wife is to go to the Lord because a prudent wife is from the Lord. Mm -hmm. so, so the wife is going to be with the Lord. You need to go to the Lord. You guys both connect to the Lord. Give your heart to the Lord and He's going to take you and put you together. Number two, the Bible says, Ask and it shall be given. You seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened to you. So in Matthew 7, 7, we need to pray. We need to pray and ask God. That's what I did when I was looking for a wife and God gave me my wife, Reese. We've been married now for 32 years. We spent a lot of time praying for God's leading, surrendering our hearts to the Lord. And then I didn't just wait around for a wife to pop up. You know, I didn't just go to sleep and wake up like Adam <laughs> and expect, oh, there's a wife going to be there. I prepared myself to be able to take care of a wife. I made sure I had an education. I made sure I had practical skills, vocational skills. I was able to have a job, to work, to, to, to support a wife. And that's really important. And of course, I also got counsel. You know, it says in a multitude of counselors, there is wisdom. And if you don't get counsel, you fall in love. And we don't want to fall into love. We want to step into mm -hmm. love. So it's right. very important to get counsel, to get preparation, um, to go to the Lord, to pray, and let God lead you and guide you. And He will. Wow. Amen. I like that. We don't want to fall in love. We want to step into love. You were love. listening. That's, yeah, I'm taking notes. All right. <laughs> yeah. All right. <laughs> Maybe your brother Hale. <laughs> right? 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 Well, you never know. You never know. <laughs> All right. All right. <laughs> like it. <laughs> Shelly, you're going to have a little bit longer to answer this question. Uh, did the martyrs that died suffer? I asked this because some were singing and smiling as they were dying. This is from Joel out of South Carolina. Oh, Joel, I thought this, I've asked this question myself. Martyr in the Greek means to witness. And the Christian use of the term martyr came to uh, be used of people who witnessed their faith for the Lord, I mean, of their faith for the Lord, and then they would be put to death because of that. And we know the first uh, spirit Phil Deacon of the church, Stephen, was one of the first seven, and mm. he was martyred. He was the first martyr, Christian martyr. And as he's being stoned to death in Acts 7, 16, his dying breath, he just says, Lord, don't charge this sin to them. Boy, that's an amazing thought. In 8098 to 305, thousands upon thousands were slain. They were martyred by Rome. And then we know that in the Inquisition of the Middle Ages, the Dark Ages, we know that the Mother Church killed millions because they would not, they, they killed them for the crime of uh, heresy. Heresy. Mm -hmm. heresy, because mm -hmm. they would not agree with the traditions of papalism, but these people wanted to stay faithful to Christ in the Word. So it's interesting because the persecution of these martyrs, the effect on the church was that their blood was like the seed for the church. All these martyrs became overcomers and conquerors. In Revelation 12, 11, it says, they overcame him, the accuser of the brethren. They overcame the devil by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. Mm. And they did not love their lives unto the death. So he's saying they overcame for these three reasons. They've got the blood of the Lamb that justifies them before the Lord. They've got the word of their testimony. They're faithful witnesses to God's work and act. And they'd rather die then deny Jesus because they didn't love their lives to the death. Now, literary tra uh, tradition does hold that many of the martyrs sang as they were burned at the stake. Mm -hmm. I remember John Huss reading the story mm -hmm. of him being in his prison, trying to take a candle and he knew he was going to be burned at the stake and he tried to put his hand over it mm -hmm. and he just couldn't. Mm -hmm. And so he was like, oh, but then they say he sang. Did they experience pain? Mm. Did Jesus experience pain? Mm -hmm. You know, you'd have to say that they didn't have a natural 
response to pain. So here's what I believe. In 1 Kings 8, 59, Solomon is speaking of God and he says that God mm. maintains the cause of his servant and the cause of mm -hmm. his people, Israel, as each day requires. Mm. So when Jesus mm -hmm. said to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you, what Paul was in prison and he's singing and praising the Lord. So I believe that God will give us grace mm -hmm. to meet mm -hmm. the need. That's Amen. right, absolutely. Amen, thank you for that Amen. answer, Shelley. Pastor Day, we're gonna go to you on this question. This, you're, it's like a three minute question for you. So you'll have a it's little like bit a longer. Question. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> Can you explain <laughs> Romans chapter 14, verse two? Only the weak eat vegetables. All right, all right. So this is one of those questions that uh, again, even many vegetarians, they read this and they think, what are you saying, Paul? You're calling me weak. Are you saying I'm weak? That's not technically what Paul is saying here. To understand this, this verse two, you first need to back up to verse one. So let's read verse one and go on to verse two and three. So verse one says, Re receive, this is Romans 14, verse one, receive one who is weak in the faith. Okay, that's the key right there. Mm. One who is weak in the faith, but not to dispute over doubtful things. For one believes he may eat all things, but he who is weak only eats vegetables. And then verse three, let him who eats despise him who does not eat. Uh, not despise this, Excuse me, not despise him who does not eat and let not him who does not eat judge him who eats. Mm -hmm. uh, it's interesting because it goes on to say, for God has received him. Amen. This is important to understand. This whole chapter, and many people get confused on Romans 14, and I'm sure we'll get many, many more questions about Romans 14. But um, this whole chapter actually has nothing to do really with the preference of diet and foods. Mm -hmm. This is not the central issue or theme that Paul is addressing. This whole entire chapter actually is him writing as a part of his letter to address some of the issues that was going on in the church of Rome much like was happening in the church of Corinth. Because in this chapter, it comes up over and over again, words like, you know, not to dispute, not to judge, um, you know, not to show contempt against your brother, you know, give account to yourself, not to judge, not causing, a, you know, being a stumbling block for your brother, you know, make peace, edify one another, do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. These types of words keep coming up over and over and over. Your brother stumbles and is offended or is made weak. What Paul is addressing is the issue that there we have your, in, in every church, and this still is true, true today, in every church there's those who are spiritually strong. And by the way, Paul identifies himself as the spiritually strong in Romans 15, 1, the very next chapter. And so these weak are not weak in the sense that they're, you know, horrible Christians or that they're not, you know, real Christians. It's just they are spiritual, they're not as spiritually mature as some of the other brethren. And so that's what Paul is addressing here. He's saying, look, some of you spiritually mature brethren are allowing these contentions and these divisions issues that are not really salvational, that's not really big. And, and some of these other weaker Christians, these less spiritually mature brothers and sisters are coming in as new believers into the church. Maybe some of them had some, you know, a different ascetic beliefs of asceticism, you know, preferences on certain days that they ate certain things here or certain things they didn't eat over here. And it was causing questions and divisions among the church. So Paul is writing to the church and he's saying, look, stop allowing these issues to divide. You, you, you spiritually mature brothers, they're strong. You're going to end up causing the weak, the spiritually immature, the less mature to stumble. You're going to become a stumbling block for them and you're going to end up pushing these brothers and sisters out of the faith. We kind of get an overall idea of this when we get to Romans 15 verses 1 through 6. Notice what the Bible says. This is the very next chapter and this is the response to the previous chapter. He says, we then who are strong ought to bear the scruples of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his, for his good leading to edification. For even Christ Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever things were written down, for what written in our learning, that we through our patience and comfort and, and the scriptures might have hope. Now may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded towards one another, according to Christ Jesus, that you may notice with one mind and one mouth glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. We know he's not calling vegetarians weak. Otherwise, that'd make Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, you know, weak Christians, right? Or secondhand Christians. That's not the issue he's dealing with. He's simply writing to address the issues that was dividing the new brothers and sisters coming into the faith from those who had been in the church for a while. He's saying, look, don't let these issues divide you. Come together, edify 
one another. Amen. Thank mm -hmm. you for that answer, Pastor Day. Pastor Rafferty, we're going to come to you on this one. Sure. How do we study the Bible, understand it, and mm -hmm. connect scriptures from different books of the Bible? I know Googling is not ideal, mm -hmm. but I often Google to understand passages and see other scriptures that explain the passage. Mm -hmm. I have a simple New King James Version Bible. It's not a study Bible, nor does it contain cross-reference verses. This is from Addie out of Washington. All right, Addie. Well, that is such a good question. In fact, learning how to study the Bible changed my life. So I just want to give you one simple thing that you can do that will actually absolutely explode the way you study the Bible, and that is get yourself a strong, exhaustive concordance of the Bible. You can get it on an app. I've got it on my phone. You know, you can just download it. You can get one for free. I spent a little bit of money on mine because it had some features, some extra features that I really wanted to have. And a strong concordance allows you to, to search the Bible, to search uh, words, word definitions in the Greek and Hebrew, and then to connect those word searches with other verses where that word is used. It lets you go deep or shallow, depending on what you want to do. You just, you might be looking up a word like uh, we just looked in Romans chapter 14, and it talks about, you know, meat there and vegetables, and you could look up that word. What does it mean? What's the original Greek word? Where is it used in other passages of the scripture? And that will really help you to see how that word might be used somewhere else, and it will bring out a little bit more of the meaning there when you look in those other verses and compare the two. Of course, when you transition from the New Testament to the Old Testament, you're going from Greek to Hebrew, and you won't necessarily be able to cross-reference those words in the Greek, but you can sometimes cross-reference them when it's in the English because sometimes they'll use basically the same words and have the same meaning. So, and then what you want to do is you want to get yourself, I would encourage you to get yourself as many different versions of the Bible as you can. Now you might have an app that you can download them on. Uh, I, use, I, I use every Bible that I can get my hands on. I do have a King James as my basic foundation study Bible and uh, the new King James is great. Uh, it comes from a different set of manuscripts and so they, they, there's some solidity there you're not going to find in some of the newer versions but there's a lot of the newer versions that, that will help you with a text that might be difficult to understand in the King James or the New King James. So I encourage you to study as many Bibles as possible, get yourself a Strong's app or a Strong's Concordance, hard co uh, copy, I've got one of those. And if you really need help with learning how to use it, I've got some basic How to Study the Bible 101 lessons that I can email you or send to you. Just get a hold of us here at 3ABN. I'd be glad to get those to you. Amen. Amen. Excellent answer, Pastor Rafferty. I just want to take a moment to tell you how to reach out, send in your questions, because you have questions, the Bible has answers, and we want to answer them from the Word of God and give you those answers. You can text those questions to 618-228-3975, or you may email your questions to BibleQA at 3ABN.TV. And if you have Instagram, please go to at 3ABN underscore official and send those questions in. Time is moving along rather rapidly. Uh, Shelly, we're going to go to you. The okay. Bible says that I should not covet the wife of my neighbor, and yet God through the Holy Spirit had Mary pregnant while she was with Joseph. Did God violate his own law? Were there no other women? Why Mary? This is from Anisio in Angola, and I just have to say Anisio. No, God did not violate his own law. As a matter of fact, God's Ten Commandments reflect his character of love and holiness. In Exodus 20, 17, the Tenth Commandment does say, you shall not covet your neighbor's house or your neighbor's wife or anything that is your neighbor's. But you've got to understand what the word covet means. To covet is to have a wrongful desire. Mm. This is a selfish heart that it's, it's a greedy heart mm. that um, it's, it's the selfish heart motive behind the outward act, you could say. So people who covet have an uncontrollable longing for more. In James 1.13, Anisio, the Bible says, James 1.13, God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. God cannot covet, 
because he cannot sin. Love does not sin. So when in Luke 12, 15, Jesus said, take heed and beware of covetousness. He's not going to warn us and then turn around and do something himself. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of the things he possesses. So you asked, why Mary? God had to have a virgin woman mm -hmm. for the mother of, when he came down to be incarnated. The virgin woman had to, it was going to be the seed of a woman is where the Messiah would come from mm -hmm. and the seed of God as the Holy Spirit overshadowed her. The reason I believe that God chose a woman who was betrothed is because he was making it easier for her because she would have a husband mm -hmm. to support mm -hmm. her and the Holy Child. But God does not, I mean, to me, the incarnation is the most un selfish act of self-sacrificing love there is. Mm -hmm. There's nothing selfish about it. God did not covet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Shelley. Yeah. Thank you. Pastor Day, is it biblical, sola scriptura, <laughs> to have national flags displayed in the house of God? What is its significance? What purpose does this practice serve in the worship of the Almighty in His sanctuary? How did this practice evolve? Why is no one in the SDA church taking a stand against this practice if it is not biblical? And I'm just going to add this part. How are you going to answer this in two minutes? <laughs> <laughs> well, there's no possible way I can answer all of those questions in two minutes. I want to address the central, I guess, theme among all of those questions, which is, you know, placing flags, or in this case, national flags, in God's house. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the simple answer is that the Bible says absolutely nothing uh, about placing flags, national flags, in God's house. Um, and so we can't simply go to the Bible and say that it's wrong or that it's right. Uh, we have to go off, off principle, right? Just because the Bible doesn't specifically address it does not mean that we can't follow certain principles as found in there. Now let me, before I get straight into the particular scripture here, let me just make mention, you know, I know I can speak from my country's perspective as an American citizen and as a patriot of this nation. I've been to churches all my life where I've seen flags. Mm. The American flag displayed somewhere in mm -hmm. the church. And I've never once myself or seen anybody else bow down and worship that flag. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I've never seen that, never have I, have I witnessed that. Um, you know, the truth of the matter is many people think that it's an issue because they think it's somehow a violation of maybe the first or second commandment where it talks about worshiping other gods or in this case bowing down to graven images and worshiping idols of some such. But I would say that, uh, you know, in this case we have to apply principle. And the truth of the matter is to many people, the American flag, for example, is a symbol of freedom. It's a symbol of the freedoms that they have to worship in that nation. So when I look at that flag, I don't worship it as a God or as an idol. But you know what? When I look at that American flag, it reminds me that I'm in a church worshiping God because mm -hmm. that nation allows me uh, and grants me the freedom to be able to do so. Mm -hmm. And so again, I think we have to check ourselves in that manner. Uh, biblically speaking, yes, if we're worshiping it or we're idling it in, a, in an unhealthy spiritual state, then absolutely we need to be careful in that case. You know, Jesus even also goes on just to be balanced here. Jesus does talk about rendering unto Caesar what is Caesar and unto God's what is God, making sure that we have a, a safe separation of church and state in this, in this particular situation. Uh, but at the end of the day, my friends, I think we have to also apply the principles found in Romans 14, that if it's something that's going to cause your brother to stumble or to be made weak, and for instance, I'm reading Romans 14 verse 19 here, it says, let us pursue the things which make for peace and the things by which one may edify another. Verse 21, it goes on to say, nor do anything by which your brother stumbles or is offended or is made weak. And of course, in the last few verses, he says, do you have faith, right? And in the last verse, he actually goes on to say, whatever is not of faith is of sin. So if this is something that bothers you, bring it to the attention of your pastor. Let your community, your church, make that decision based off the conviction that the body of people have. But, it, but at the end of the day, we have to go back to the principles of Scripture. The commandments are not being violated if someone is not worshiping or bowing down or idling that image. It does represent freedom. It does represent, uh, you know, uh, the freedoms that we have to worship in this country. And as long as there's not any worshiping, 
we should be safe. Mm. Mm -hmm. Good answer. Absolutely. Good answer. Pastor Rafferty, historicism has the past record that our Savior was crucified in the week of two Sabbaths. Jesus uses the sign of Jonah to describe a sign of his time in the earth. I know Jesus was not born on the literal Christmas day of the year. Is the Good Friday wrongfully claiming his day on the cross like his birthday? It confuses those who challenge me about the authenticity of the word. This comes from Reggie. Mm, well, Reggie, <laughs> actually, you've got it right. Um, Good Friday, which is what the Catholics call, I was raised Catholic, Good Friday was the day that Christ died. And we find that in Luke chapter 23. If we just want to look there in Luke chapter 23, we're going to start in verse 52. This man went to Pilate begged the body of Jesus and he took it down and wrapped it in linen, verse 53, laid it in a sepulcher that was hewn in stone wherein never a man was laid before it was laid. And that day was the preparation and the Sabbath drew on. So the preparation is Friday. Sabbath, of course, is Saturday. And then it goes on to say, the woman also which came with him from Galilee followed after, beheld the sepulcher, how his body was laid. They returned and prepared spices and ointments and they rested on the Sabbath day according to the commandment. So the Sabbath was drawing near when Christ was taken off the cross. Mm -hmm. That was preparation day. That was Friday. The Sabbath was a high Sabbath. That means that the Passover fell or another ceremony normally, it was the Passover this time, fell on that same seventh day Sabbath day. That's what made it a high Sabbath. And then it says in verse one of chapter 24, now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came to the sepulcher bringing spices, which they prepared and certain others, and they found the stone rolled away and Christ, of course, had resurrected. That was Sunday. So you've got Friday that he died, Sabbath he rested in the tomb, just like he did at creation. You know, he finished his work in creation. He finished his work of redemption, rested in the tomb on Sabbath, was raised on Saturday. Now you might ask, well, I thought he was going to be in the belly of the whale, or like in the belly of the earth, like Jonah was in the whale's belly for three days and three nights. That began on Thursday night. When he was at the Last Supper, Jesus was getting ready to betray him. He went out after dipping the sop with Christ, and it was night. And that night, Jesus went to Gethsemane, and that's when he first started feeling the separation from God. He first underwent that wrath experience of being separated from God. In fact, he almost died in Gethsemane. So you've got Thursday night, Friday, Friday night, Saturday, Saturday night. There's the three days and the three nights, Sunday morning, he resurrects. Mm, amen. amen. Thank you nice. for unpacking that. Wonderful. Shelley. How does someone truly develop a continuous attitude to rejoice in the Lord always? Mm. Philippians chapter four, verse four, especially during uh, difficult and challenging times. Mm. James chapter one, verse two. And this comes, question comes from June and I just have to say my sister June, I've really, God's been showing me how to do this over the last couple of years. There's been a lot of surgeries, a lot of physical pain, mm. But Philippians 4, 4, let's read that and look at it. It says rejoice. Now the Greek word rejoice means to be in a state of well-being, to experience joy. But look what it says, rejoice in the Lord always. Mm. And again, I say rejoice. So how do you have joy? The source of joy is your relationship with the Lord. Mm. And it doesn't matter. You know, actually tradition says that Paul wrote this during his first imprisonment mm. in Rome. Mm -hmm. So here he is in prison mm. and he's exhorting other people, mm. rejoice. As a matter of fact, the keynote of the whole book of Philippians is joy. He mentions joy, rejoice 12 different times. Joy is a result of being at peace with God. Romans 5, 1 through 2 says, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the glory of God. Joy is a fruit of the Holy Spirit, Galatians 5, 22. Uh, we can have joy, rejoice that God's mercies are new every morning. Lamentations 3, 22 and 23. Nehemiah 8, 10 says the joy of the Lord is our strength. And when you think about God and what he does, we can have joy. Joy is not the absence of sorrow, mm. but even in the midst of our sorrow, we can let joy be ushered in on the wings of thanksgiving, mm -hmm. the wings of practicing God's yeah. presence, and you can rejoice. 
Rejoice that your sins are forgiven. Rejoice that God never leaves you mm -hmm. or forsake you. Rejoice that the mission goes forward, the gospel's being preached. Rejoice that this is not our home, we're just passing through. Mm -hmm. And rejoice that God has laid up a, an eternal reward for you in heaven. Amen. Praise <laughs> God. Praise God for Amen. joy. Uh, Pastor Day, is it wrong to play bingo half and half or lottery ticket? Where is the scripture? This is from someone in Illinois. <laughs> All right, that's actually a great question. You know, I had to look up this half and half and I wasn't able to find it. Has anybody ever heard of this, half and half? I I've never either. heard of this game. So if it's, maybe it's a typo or maybe the person has a game <laughs> called half and half. I don't know what it is, but I can address bingo. Uh, bingo is, I don't think it is an issue. I don't think it is a sin if someone plays the bingo because especially if you're not, uh, you know, gambling with it or, you know, uh, you know misusing and abusing God's resources he's blessed with you. It's a, it's a simple game and many people play it, uh, you know, just to pass time or to have, you know, a social interaction with other people. Uh, but the last part of that question dealing with, you said, lottery tickets. Lottery tickets. Now that, all right. So this is an issue. It's actually interesting. I never, I've never dealt with this. I've never had this issue, problem with gambling. But when I was doing some research on this, it's interesting that the Bible does not explicitly address, uh, you know, the issue of gambling. So in this case, just because it doesn't, you know, directly address it does not mean that there's not principles to build off of. You know, the Bible also doesn't tell us anything about smoking pot or snorting crack or anything like that. Uh, but we take the principle, obviously, that our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit and we don't want to put anything in it that's going to damage it, right? We have to look at principle here. In this case, there's a bunch of texts that we can glean from. I want to start with Proverbs 28, 20. It says, a faithful man will abound with blessings, but he who hastens to be rich will not go unpunished. You know, a lot of people with gambling, an issue of lottery tickets and, you know, putting in a little money here so that you can somehow play the game of chance to try to get something else. You know, a lot of times this comes, you know, this turns into an addiction for some people and it destroys families, it destroys lives. And so this is what this principle is talking about. Also, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10 reminds us that the love or the desire for money, the abundance of money is the root of all evil. And so again, this is an issue that can turn into something much, much greater if not kept in check. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 5 says, Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. God has given you what you need. But a lot of times in the world we live in, we say, we need more. We need more. We need an abundance mm -hmm. of more. And it turns into a covetous heart, wanting more and more and more and desiring more. And it turns into sometimes in this case, playing the lottery, gambling away your resources that mm -hmm. leads to something horrible. Proverbs 13, 11, wealth gained by dishonesty will be diminished, but he who gathers by labor will increase. Doing it honestly, God, mm -hmm. God, you know, he, pri he, he takes, uh, you know, pride in that in the sense that we work hard for what it is that we get. You know, your treasure, the Bible says, is, you know, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Matthew chapter 6, verse 21, and of course, Matthew 6, 24, Jesus also says, no man can serve two masters. You can't serve God and mammon or God and money. Mm -hmm. And so in this case, we apply these principles and make sure that we're following the biblical principles God give us. You know, the principle of tithing. You know, giving back to God what's already His. The money, it's not yours. It's not yours. Your resources is not yours. It's all His. And we want to make sure as good stewards that we're not just throwing this away by chance. So gambling, playing the lottery, stay away from it because it's God's money. It's God's resources. And we want to protect that and be honest with His resources. Amen. 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 Pastor Rafferty, you will have more time for this question here. Five minutes? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> no, not five. We'll, we'll subtract two from that. And I three, tried. There you go. <laughs> three minutes here. Please explain Isaiah chapter chapter 66, verse 24, about dead bodies burning after the third coming. Mm -hmm. I thought they, with Satan, were destroyed alive when they tried to gain entrance to heaven by force. This comes from Ken. All right, Ken, this is a really good question. Isaiah 66, verse 24. It's in the context of the new heaven and the new earth. Verse 23 says, It shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, from one Sabbath to another, shall all flesh come to worship before me, says the Lord. And in verse 22, the new heavens and the new earth. And then in verse 24, all of a sudden we have this ugly picture. And they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against me, for their worms shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched, and they shall be an abhorring unto all flesh. So the 
answer to this question is actually found in the context of the book of Isaiah. You go back to Isaiah chapter 28. That's where we find a special resurrection of those who have really been working against God and thinking that this life is all we have and there's not going to be any resurrection. And God says there's going to be a resurrection, there's going to be a judgment. And you're going to be brought forth from the grave to give an account before me. Thus says the Lord, therefore says the Lord, verse 16 of Isaiah 28. Behold, I lay in Zion a chief uh, for a foundation stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. He that believes shall not make haste. That's talking about Jesus. And that word, that phrase make, make haste is actually talking about being anxious or stressed, um, being troubled. And then in verse 17, judgment also will I lay to the line and righteousness to the plummet. Hail shall sweep away the refuge of lies and water shall overflow the hiding place for your covenant with death shall be disannulled. Your agreement with hell shall not stand when the overflowing flowing scourge passes through then shall you be trodden down from it. In other words, God's going to have a resurrection. Nobody is getting away with anything in relationship to God. We're going to reap what we sow. Mm -hmm. And the rest, of this, the rest of this chapter, it's really interesting. It talks about that specific work of executive judgment. It talks about how God is going to resurrect all of the wicked and bring them into an account. And in Romans chapter 2, it talks about how that when we reject God's goodness, we store up wrath against the day of wrath and mm -hmm. the righteous revelation of God in relationship to this day. It also describes it as a strange work. God does not want anyone to be destroyed. He doesn't want anyone to be lost. But God is a God of love and love is both merciful and just. Mm -hmm. Nobody who has committed anything horrific against any other human being is going to be let off the hook unless they put their faith in Jesus Christ. So we ask the question, well, how does this relate to the question about the thousand years? Well, this is how it works. When the New Jerusalem comes down and the resurrection takes place, we're into the, the post thousand years. We're post thousand years, New Jerusalem's on this earth, the wicked come around the city. So we're in that time when we're all worshiping God, we're in that time when from one new moon to another, one Sabbath to another, we're all gonna worship God. That's the time frame we're in. But before we get to that time, we're going to see the executive, judge, the executive judgment. And it says here, and this is just one verse I want you to look at. It says here that in verse 19, for that from that time that it goes forth, it will take you for by morning by morning shall it pass over and day, by day and by night it shall be a vexation to understand the report. In other words, the destruction of the wicked doesn't take place in 24 hours. It doesn't even take place in 48 hours. It takes time. And that's what Isaiah 66 is talking about. In that context, there's going to be a time, a period of time. I don't know if it's going to be a week or 10 days or a month. I don't know how much time it's going to be. I do know this. Satan is going to suffer the longest because we're going to see the whole history. God is going to give us a whole video of the history and everyone's going to see their place and they're going to, they're going to feel that wrath, that rejection of God's goodness because of the decisions they've made in relationship to their rejection of God. It's going to be a mental vexation and Satan's going to suffer the longest. Mm. But like you said, it is going to be over. It's going to end and the wicked are going to be ashes. They're not going to be tormented for all eternity, forever and ever. It's a certain amount of time and then it's over. Mm. Amen. Amen. Shelley Quinn, please explain Luke chapter 16 verses 19 through 31 in light of verses like Ecclesiastes chapter 9 verse 10. This comes from Joe out of Ontario. Ah, Joe, this is a great one. Ecclesiastes 9:10 says, There is no work or device for knowledge or wisdom in the grave where you are going. So the dead know nothing. That's what the Bible tells us, right? Mm -hmm. They're asleep. But now you come to Luke 16, 19 through 31. This is a parable of a certain rich man and a certain beggar named Lazarus. This isn't Lazarus, Mary and Martha's uh, brother. And Luke 16 is not talking about what happens after death. A, a parable is a short teaching to bring about some kind of a moral teaching. And what the moral teaching that if you, we follow this closely, Jesus is saying to the, to the Pharisees, your money won't save you. So let's look just a little bit in Luke 15. Jesus used consistent parable language. Luke 15, 11, the parable of the prodigal son. He said, a certain man had two sons. In Luke 16, 1, the parable of the unjust steward, there was a certain rich man 
who had a steward. So you see this is parabolic language. Luke 16, 19 through 20. There was a certain rich man and a certain beggar named Lazarus. So what happened just before Jesus told this Pharisee, this Pharisee, this parable in Luke 16, 13 and 14, Jesus had told the Pharisees, you can't serve God and money. And the Pharisees scoffed at him. You know, Pharisees believed that riches showed the blessing of God. They also believed they had a common parable that they told that they, there was kind of a Hellenistic influence that had penetrated their belief system. And they told this parable about the rich would die and go to the bosom of Abraham to paradise. You find that in the Talmud and that the poor Oh, they were destined to go to the other place. But here's how Jesus turns it around on them. He reverses the role. And in Luke 16, 19 and 20, he tells the parable saying that the rich man who did not use his resources for good reasons. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the rich man's dining sumptuously and this certain beggar is lying at his gates and he's hoping and praying for a few crumbs from the rich man's table and the dogs are licking his wounds. Oh my goodness, these Pharisees, this would have made this man absolutely repulsive to them. But Jesus has the beggar up in heaven reclining next to Abraham. He's got the poor or the rich man down in Hades saying, oh, send me someone to touch my finger uh, with some water, or touch my tongue with some water and cool my tongue. And he's simply, he's not teaching what happens after death because Jesus in John chapter 11 teaches that death is asleep. But in Luke 16, when the young man says, oh, Father Abraham, send someone to my brothers that is, uh, so that they will repent because if somebody rises from the dead and they repent, all right. And you know what he says? Nope. If they don't, Abraham, Father Abraham says back to him, if they don't, they've got the word, they don't believe Moses, they don't believe the word, then nobody's going to convince them. Mm. Amen. Thank you, Shelley. Pastor Day, we're going to go to you. Time is running out here. I have met a young woman who states she is a card reader. Please give scriptures I could share and hopefully lead her away from this. I would love to have her friendship. This is from Judy out of Texas. Yeah, you know, card reading is absolutely a false practice. These people that do this, they're crooks, they're, they're false. They can't tell the future, but yet they're certainly not being led by the Spirit of God. They're led by another spirit. And so that that being said, you know, the Bible refers to words like, you know, practicing divination, soothsaying. This is what these type of card readers are, you know, conducting or, or communicating with mediums, familiar spirits, sorcery. And so in this case, you know, you know, when you go to these card readers and they turn over the cards and you see the symbols and the, and the different uh, images and stuff, and then they want to try to tell you, oh, you know, I'm, I see in your future that you're going to do, you know, something horrible is going to happen to you or something bad is going to happen. Oh, something great is going to happen in your future. And people buy into this stuff. Mm -hmm. And really what it is, is it's a spiritualistic practice. It's in the Bible forbids it. Let me give you some scriptures here. Leviticus chapter 19. Mm. This is a big one. Leviticus 19 verses 26 and 31. Uh, this is God speaking. He says, you shall not eat anything with blood, nor shall you practice divination or soothsaying. Give no regard to mediums and familiar spirits, mm. nor do not seek after them to be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God, right? Leviticus chapter 20, very next chapter, he repeats it again. Similarly, he says, and the person who turns to mediums and familiar spirits to prostitute himself mm. with them, I will set my face against that person and cut him off from his people. And then verse 27 of Luke, or excuse me, Leviticus chapter 27, or 20, Luke 20, verse 27. It says, a man or a woman who is a medium who, uh, or who has a familiar spirit or has a familiar spirit shall surely be put to death. 
So this is how, this is God's attitude towards it. He doesn't want you communicating with these people because who are they communicating with? Mm -hmm. Not him. Mm -hmm. And if they're not communicating with him, who are they potentially communicating with? The devil himself or demons. And even Revelation chapter 21 and 22 makes it very, very clear. Uh, in fact, it says in Revelation 22 verse uh, 14 and 15, it says, Blessed are those who do his commandments that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. But then verse 15 says, But outside that city, are dogs and sorcerers mm. and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters and whoever loves and practices a lie. Mm. So do not, whoever you are, don't go to these card readers. They practice a lie. Mm -hmm. It is sorcery and it's not of God. Mm. Wow. Thank you, Pastor Day. Pastor Rafferty, this mm. comes to us out of Florida, says, I was watching the recording of Pastor Rafferty, Mark or Mask of the Beast. Yeah. Uh, my question is, among all the evidence of the mark, why is nothing mentioned about the number of the beast, the 666? Yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, who is that, Mark out of Florida? Uh, no, no, somebody out of, out of Florida. Okay, <laughs> that's a really good question. And I think sometimes we just run out of time. You know, there are a number of uh, characteristics of the beast power in Revelation 13 and there's also a number of characteristics of the beast power identified in Revela or Daniel chapter 7. In Daniel 7 it's the little horn, in Revelation 13 it's the beast out of the sea. Mm -hmm. And one of those characteristics is he has the number of a man and his number is 666. Three sixes, six, six, six. You know, when I was, uh, before I was really a devoted Christian, I remember thinking about the mark of the beast, six, 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 and I was curious about it. I want to study Revelation. What does this mean? What is it, six, six, six? And I used to watch movies, six, six, six. You know, what is it? Well, it's simply the number of a man. And what we do in Bible prophecy is we let the Bible kind of interpret itself. We look at all the characteristics. This is one of them. And this characteristic is basically the title of the man of sin, which is. Uh, Philae Dei, excuse me. Philarius uh, Dei, Vicarious Philae Dei. There we go. <laughs> I'm going to get there one day. Day, yes. And that is the, the, the title of the papal, uh, the Pope, the head of the papacy. And that is one of the many characteristics of the papacy. I'm sorry for that. I, <laughs> no, I, I should have had this uh, <laughs> ready in my notes here. I have it in my notes, Vicarious Philae Dei. And when you calculate the, the numerical equivalent of that name, every letter has a numerical equivalent. You can do it in the Roman, you can do it in the Latin, you can do it in the Greek. Every, ro every uh, numerical equivalent, each one, and you put it all together, it, it comes to 666. Now, we do not place the entire interpretation of the man of sin on this one characteristic. Mm -hmm. This is one of many That's characteristics. Right. Yeah. And so if this one characteristic is the only one that, that, that meets up with the papacy with the Pope, then that's not good enough for us. So this is just one in a number of them. We usually emphasize all of them. Sometimes you don't have time for this one. Sometimes you don't remember how to say the title correctly, <laughs> but this is exactly what we understand it to mean. Oh, wow, <laughs> excellent, excellent breakdown of that. Um, we are just about to go to our break here. I want to show you how you can send in your questions and we'll take a short break and we will be right back. So don't go anywhere. Stick around for more answers. If you're enjoying our 3ABN Bible Q&A, then tell your friends. Each Monday, we'll bring you a fresh program answering the Bible questions you send us, using God's Holy Word to shed light on those texts that seem difficult to understand. To have your questions answered on a future program, just email them to us at BibleQA at 3ABN.TV. That's BibleQA at 3ABN.TV. You may also text your questions to 618 228 3975. That's 618-228-3975. Be sure to include your name and where you live, and then watch 3ABN Bible Q&A for answers from God's Word. Glad you decided to stick around with us. So I'm going to open up the floor for any final thoughts. Pastor Rafferty? Well, just a quick thought in Isaiah 66. You know, I didn't touch on one point that was asked in the question about, you know, the, those going forth to the men that have transgressed and seen that their worm shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched. That terminology is simply talking about 
ultimate complete destruction. The fire can't be quenched, the worm mm -hmm. doesn't die. Those are two yeah. elements that destroy. Worms eat our bodies, the fire burning up. And what it means is, is that those elements are gonna be in place until there's nothing else to be consumed, nothing else to be destroyed. So this is definitely talking about that final second death. And it's simply referring to the fact that that's gonna take place post the thousand years. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm. You know, Pastor James did such a phenomenal job explaining the 666 identification of a man. And I remember years ago, I worked at a grocery store. People would come in and their, their total was $6.66. Take some gum, throw some gum on there. <laughs> or, or their change back was $6.66. Oh, keep a penny, you know. The superstitions around this, it's not the number of the devil like some people think. Mm. It's a number of a man. Mm. And so that man happens to be the leader of this man, this, this system, antichrist system mm -hmm. of Bible prophecy. Don't get confused. It's a number of a man. Mm -hmm. Good. <laughs> we just want to tell you all that we love you and we thank you so much for sending in your questions. This is such a privilege to have the opportunity to study and to mm -hmm. share with you. And we do it because of you. So we're so glad you tuned in. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Thank you all for your uh, firm studying of the word and providing us with these answers. Um, and just want to thank you for taking the time to send in your questions, to write down your questions, to send them in, to join us as we study the Word of God. Remember, knowledge without application is dead, just like faith without works is dead. Study God's Word and live a changed life. Amen. Amen.